Happy Wednesday, Covenant. Look, let's welcome our worship team real quick. Woo! So perfect, so perfect. Okay, so raise your hand if you have been told your shirt's on backwards. Yeah, Kobe came in earlier and I said, Kobe, <laughs> but I totally forgot. So guess what I had to do? Turn my shirt inside backwards. Inside out, backwards. Okay, so our game, we are going, we have teams. We have girls and boys, okay? We have one group, two groups, three. We have three teams. What they're going to do, they're going to walk all the way to me backwards because it's backwards night. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> okay, see, y'all, I can be pretty cool. Mom joke. There we go. That's a knee slapper right there. <laughs> Okay, so they're going to walk all the way to me backwards, turn around, walk all the way back, touch their partner. Partner has to come all the way back and back, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's count them down. Three, two, one, go. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Go, Kenley. Oh, she lost her shoe. Turn around, go backwards. Oh, goodness. Oh, oh, watch me. Oh, <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Go, go, go. Go backwards. Go backwards. Oh, go, Ben. Oh, goodness. Oh, Ben. All the way to me, Brody. Okay, go back. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. <laughs> the Lord is with these kids. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Go meet someone. I truly mean it. Go meet someone. Say hi. All right, we have one minute before we get this worship service started off with. Why don't you stand to your feet and meet somebody that you don't know? Come on, stand to your feet. Let's spread the love of Jesus tonight. Let's let's meet one another. Let's fellowship.
Precious 
anybody else thinks. I don't care what happened today. I'm not worried about what I need to do when I go home. I want to take the next couple of minutes to declare what a Savior He is. I want you just to lift your voice. We're going to sing it one more time, and I want you to abandon. I challenge you. I encourage you. I invite you to abandon everything else that would fill your mind, things that have hurt you, things that didn't go your way today, things that are filling up your mind that you need to get to after church. Look over to your friend and say, let it go right now. Let it go right now. And we are about to lift him up as the Savior that he is. So come on, everybody. Christ is risen. All right. Oh, what a Savior. Lead him, Lexi. Oh, what a Savior. You're singing it to him. Isn't he on a Wednesday night and you didn't decide to sit out tonight you are here in this place and Father we rejoice in you right now we put you as the center focal point of everything that's going on in this place tonight it is not our church it is your church it is not our agenda it is your agenda it is not our spirit it is your spirit Father, we call for you in the name of Jesus to fill every room, every classroom. Anoint every teacher, anoint every word that is being spoken, and may it all please you. Father, I thank you that you have equipped us with every good thing for doing your work. And now I pray that you would open every heart, every teenage heart, every old person heart, every young person heart, every adolescent heart, open every heart to receive your word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, put your hands together one more time. You can be dismissed. Good job, praise team. I want to introduce somebody that I met just about 30 minutes ago. She's probably going to be like, why are you doing this to me? I was looking out of Eagle Auto Sales out the front door. If you're familiar with Eagle Auto Sales, we have a small parking lot, and then there's Henderson Street, which runs right in front of the elementary. And I look out there, and I see a, like a 2007 Maroon Taurus coming backwards 
like passing up Eagle Auto and backing up in the middle of the highway and then turning in. And it's someone that I met about, like I said, 30 minutes ago or 45 minutes ago. And she began to talk to me, and I began to talk to her. And then we started talking about church. And I said, do you want to follow me up to church tonight? And she said, I got to run a few errands, but yes, I'll be right back. So she left, and I'm thinking she'll never come back. She shows back up, and she says, I had to run the red light to get here. <laughs> Her name is Terry. Stand up, Terry. Come on, stand up. This is Terry. Terry, I want to tell you, first of all, thank you for blessing this house and coming today. I hope that you're blessed. And amen. There's a reason why she stopped in the middle of the highway and backed up. And I want you to be blessed today, okay? Thank you. Well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> you know what my heart's desire is? Is to have the fire of the Holy Ghost from start to finish all the time. Amen. How many loves to feel the presence of God? Amen. I like the fire. I like to feel the fire in every area. And the singing tonight had the fire in it. Amen. All right. So uh, the Bible studies is, is just wonderful, and we're proud of all of the people. I'm going to give you seven things that you need to do in your life. I got these down today, so I'm going to give them to you. Seven rules of life. All right? Here they are. Let's see if I can get this in the right position. Seven rules of life. Make peace with your past. So it does not affect your present. That's good. All right, now let me get it where I can read a little bit further, better. What others think of you is none of your business. Time heals almost everything. Give it time. Don't compare your life to others and don't judge them. You have no idea what their journey is all about. Amen. It's all right not to know all the answers. They will come to you when, when you least expect it. You are in charge of your happiness. Nobody else is. So smile. You don't own all the problems in the world. Amen. All right, seven rules. So keep those in your mind, and we're going to continue to get better, and I'm proud of Sister Bree. Glad that you've been faithful. Glad you've been faithful. Faithful is important to me, and uh, so I'm glad that you're here. Brian's going to teach us again on continually better. How many has been enjoying the Wednesday nights? Amen. All right. All right. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Although this... Uh, week. When we leave church today, it'll still be daylight because a couple days ago was the longest day of the year. So those of you that go to bed at 830, you're still having to go to bed in the daylight right now. Daddy D going to bed in the daylight. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love this time of year and um, I love what God is doing here at Covenant Church. Amen. So I'm going to pick up with where I left off last week. Uh, somebody tell me what what the topic was last week for continually better for sure and then I talked about a specific yes prayer everybody say prayer is Brianna here is Brianna oh, she's in the nursery oh yeah I am so jealous oh I'm so jealous <laughs> I am so jealous <clears throat> I was gonna I was gonna have everybody look at her maybe hold her for a second that's okay. I'll get to her. So the very first two words of the Lord's Prayer, they are what? Somebody say them. Our Father. Everybody say, Our Father. So look over to your friend and tell them you're not an only child. Okay? So we're going to continue to talk about prayer, <coughs> but <coughs> since... We are not an only child. We are not only the only one. 
we have a responsibility when we say our father that means there is somebody else that is in this family and we can't have the attitude like Cain had that said when he had murder in his heart am I my brother's keeper <laughs> the answer to that is yes you are so our father means we are a part of something bigger which means our prayers should not always just be about us our prayers should not always be me at the center focal point of every prayer I pray there is something that I'm going to talk to you about tonight that is called intercessory prayer all right intercessory prayer has the root word that many of you have um, probably heard before it's a common English word called intercede all right to intercede well to intercede means this it means to intervene on behalf of another so since you are not an only child every prayer you pray should not be just about you you have a responsibility to intervene on behalf of somebody else all right so what does intervene mean intervene means to come between so as to prevent or alter a result or course of events I have spiritual brothers and sisters that are facing things that I have the spiritual responsibility of intervening in their life but I don't intervene like this I don't get up in your business show up at your house tell you what you ought to do tell you what you should do and if I was you I'd not that kind of intervene that's called interference all right intervention when you're truly going to intervene effectively the way to do it effectively is to go to the father to the father and then let him intervene prime example I had two brothers I was the oldest my parents sometimes would put me in charge and they would leave and I thought I had it all figured out Shannon was 16 months younger than me and Jan Michael was uh, uh, right out about four years younger than me and I thought that I could tell them exactly what to do and how to do it and guess what they didn't want to hear it from me they didn't want me telling them what to do and guess what your spiritual brothers and sisters don't want to hear it from you either so what I had to do hey dad Dannon and Chucky stole some skull and they're right up the street and they're dipping it and what did dad do because he knew intervention was necessary because at eight years old and six years old or seven and five or something like that it was not a good idea for those boys to be dipping skull behind his back all right so I just want you to follow me here for just a second in order to truly get somewhere with my brothers I had to go to our father and then our father handled it very wisely all right so maybe you ought to just step back a little bit shut your mouth a little bit quit bossing everybody around around you telling them what they should do and what they ought to do how about you just step back and go to the father and say okay God on behalf of my brothers on behalf of my sisters on behalf of my friends God they need your intervention all right make sense so we're gonna talk about that tonight so who do you intercede for this is a Bible study you're gonna learn a lot tonight who do you intercede for remember to intercede means you're gonna come between a person and their circumstances a person and their results all right who do we intercede on behalf of we're gonna find it in the Word of God in the very beginning in Genesis Genesis chapter 18 you will find that Abraham interceded 
for Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were cities. So listen, it is your responsibility, I'm preaching to myself, to intercede on behalf of cities. It's our responsibility. Governments don't just automatically follow a sovereign God. And a sovereign God will sit back and let cities go to hell in a handbasket if there is no church to intercede. Prime example, Sodom and Gomorrah. Nobody was interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah, but Abraham had a loved one there. And he said, God, and I'm just going to paraphrase. You can read it when you get home if you want a good Bible study. Genesis 18, 20 through 26. He said, God, would you destroy that city if there were 50 people there that were righteous? And God said, no. If there are 50 people there, I won't destroy the city. And then Abraham started thinking, and he's like, God, but what if there's only 45? If there were 45 people there, would you destroy that city? And God said, no, if I can find 45 righteous people, I won't. You see there, Abraham is having a conversation with God. And then Abraham said, well, what if there's 40? And God said, I won't do it for 40. And then he said, well, God, hold on, God, don't get aggravated, but I still need to intervene. I still need to interfere because somebody there is righteous, and you're about to do something really drastic. So what if there's just 30 and he said, I won't, I won't destroy it for 30. Well, God, what about 20? And he said, I won't destroy it for 20. And then he said, all right, well, what about 10? He is holding God back. That's what intercession is, is when you go to the throne of God on behalf of somebody else and you get, let me give a prime example. Can I have Mike and Cammie, please? Well, Cammie's so shy. I won't do Cammie. Let's do Mike and Pastor Jan. Is Pastor Jan shy? All right, both of y'all get on. Uh, Mike, you come get on this side. All right. So this is Mike, or this is a, represents a city or whatever, a person, a family member, whatever you're praying, you're interceding for. And this is results, what is bound to happen, okay? I'm trying to, <laughs> or, or Satan or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you are... I'm not going to do that to my dad. All right? These are bad results, bad consequences, person you're interceding for. All right? This person is headed to consequences. Intercession is this. Hold on, God. Hold on, God. Results, you just hold, you hold off for a second. Okay, God, now listen. For my brother, before he gets here, God, I need you to intervene. If nobody else is going to stand here to hold back these results, let me just get in the way for just a minute because my friend is headed to death. You got it? That's what intercession is. You get in between that person or that city or that nation and their consequences. All right? Thank you. So, number one, <laughs> I couldn't do that to Mike. He's my handsome man that got my podium. <sighs> yeah. All right. So, write down number one, cities. We intercede for cities. I'll just give you some prime examples. Or Portland, Oregon. Needs some intercessors. New York City today needs some intercessors. I heard someone say this week that you go to New York City and it doesn't look like it's ever looked before. It's pretty much under siege. Because the cops won't fight the crime. Because they said right now, Todd's going to love this as an officer, crime is up and arrests are down. Because cops won't arrest, and here's why. Because crooked judges and crooked district attorneys are releasing crooked people. You know what? That is not something that anybody can fix with their hands. So New York City needs an intercessor to stand between New York City and complete meltdown, implosion. We need a church to intercede, all right? Now, let me just take it a little further. Russ, Texas, 
needs somebody to, Jacksonville, Texas, Alto, Texas needs a church to intercede. I'm not going to stay on that. Number one, cities. Number two, nations. Let's just go a little further into the word of God in Deuteronomy 9, 7 through 8. You will see that Moses interceded for Israel. Israel was an entire nation. Look over to your friend and say, it is your responsibility, just going to tell him, it is your responsibility to intercede for this nation. All right? Get this in your mind. United States of America here, where Mike is, detrimental consequences are right here. But when the church of the living God rises up, we can get God's attention. And let me just go ahead and tell you, he is sovereign, and he's wanted to move all along, but the church has not been interceding. When times were good, the church kicked back in their spiritual lazy boy, and there was nothing standing between the United States of America and complete detriment so behind the scenes enemies working church is sleeping enemies working church is sleeping today we have to rise up as a church and we have to get between and we have to separate the results from our nation following me it works if you want to read about Moses he interceded on behalf of Israel in Deuteronomy 9, 7 through 8, then 12 through 19, and 25 through 29. He said right here, he said, I prostrated myself before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord said he would destroy you. And I prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord God, do not destroy your people. Israel, destruction, Moses. You got it? United States of America, destruction, covenant churches of East Texas. Don't wait on somebody else. You know what we're supposed to do as a church? They say that the best way to starve a dog is to put three people in charge of feeding it. Because they all three think the other two did it. They all three think one of the other two did it. And so the dog starves because there's too many people that are sharing the responsibility. So the way to let the United States of America go downhill is for us as a church to leave it up to another church. And another church leave the praying up to us. We're going to step in as if we're the only church because our prayers are as powerful as ballistic missiles. And we have the ability to intervene on behalf of our nation. Amen. So we say, oh God, do not destroy this nation whom you have redeemed through your greatness. Carry on. So number three. So number one is cities. Number two is nations. Number three is, take you to some scripture here. Numbers 12, 10 through 13. I'm going to read it, and then I'll tell you what number three is. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous. I mean, she had leprosy, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, that quick, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, Please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So what happened here is Moses had siblings. Miriam and Aaron were Moses' siblings. Aaron and Miriam had been talking bad about Moses, bad-mouthing Moses. He was their leader, and they were questioning his leadership, and that's not really part of this lesson. But God heard, and because of their sin, consequences came. 
So what did Aaron do? Aaron turned to Moses and he said, Moses, go to God for Miriam. Don't let her die in this state. So what did Moses do? He went to God on behalf of his brother and his sister. You have spiritual brothers and sisters. You have biological brothers and sisters. You go to God on behalf of them to intervene with what's going on in their lives. You carry them to God, and he will answer your prayers for them. All right? You got it? So, number three. Physical brothers and sisters, and spiritual brothers and sisters. Jeremy Dan just texted me and said that last week the Southern Baptist Convention voted to be less involved politically. That is not what we're going to do as a church. We are going to intervene. It matters what our kids are being taught in school. It matters if our dollars go to fund abortion in Iraq. It matters, and we may not can get to Washington, D.C., but hey, so what? I'll go to the Father. All right? Don't get less involved. You pray for the nation more than you ever have before. So number three is your brothers and sisters. Number four, go to Mark 5, 21 through 23. We are to intercede for those needing healing. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Keep going. 323. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, at Jesus' feet, and he begged him earnestly. Now, I want you to find the intervention here. My little daughter lies at the point of death. Here's his daughter, and here's death. And I want you to understand it was getting really really close she was getting really really close to death the father couldn't do anything about it but he went to our father the heavenly father and he said I am intervening because my daughter is so close to death that she cannot get to you so I am going to you for her come Lord Jesus lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Now, I want you just to go down to verse 35. Now, between verse 23 and verse 35, you can read and you'll see where people went to Jairus and said, hey, don't bother Jesus. It's too late. It's too late because she's already reached the consequence. She's already reached the result. And there is no space between for you to intervene. Listen to me. Don't you let unbelieving people around you tell you something's too late. When you are going to the Father on behalf of somebody that cannot get there for themselves because they are too sick, don't you let a religion look at you and say, he doesn't still heal today. Don't you let a religion tell you, hey, that was back then. He doesn't offer healing today. Don't you let anybody else look at you and say, hey, you're wasting your time fasting. You're wasting your time praying because this cancer diagnosis is terminal. There's space enough for you to squeeze in and intervene. With that being said, I want us to stand, don't stand yet, and we are going to pray for Danny Nash again because, oh, did you just text me? I love Jeremy Pate. Oh, my nanny. They just had to rush out to take her to the hospital. Uh, that's why my mom and dad just left. So at the point where I'm talking about intervention, we're going to stand for my nanny.
We're going to stand for my nanny, and we're going to stand for Danny Nash. Nothing is too late. I don't know what's going on with my nanny. I do know she's having congestive heart failure. We, there's enough space. There is enough space. We're going to put it into action right now. So stand to your feet, if you will. Father, in the name of Jesus, we don't even have to get there. You are her father, just like you are our father. And we are calling on you right now, in Jesus' name, to go be with Joanne Eddings. You are her healer. You are her savior. Father, you are the great physician. And we go to you right now in faith. You hear the words of your church. And we are intervening in between her and whatever the result may try to be because you have the final say. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, touch her body right now. In Jesus' name, we lift you up in faith. Everybody say amen. Don't, say, don't get seated yet. Second thing, Danny Nash. Danny Nash was told last night that they are really close to putting him on something called an eco something thank you Todd for his lungs and the doctor said let's just face it people that go on this don't come off of this because they die people that go on this die of stroke or I think heart attack and they don't come off of it Danny Nash has a church that has learned that we can intervene for those that are sick. So right now, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne for Danny Nash. We do not receive the report that it is too late because you are the one that created his lungs and you are the one that makes a way out of no way and you are the one almighty God that says there is nothing too hard for me I am the way maker nothing is impossible so father in the name of Jesus whatever you have to do whatever blockage you have to bust through whatever you have to do father we know that you are the healer and we command healing and restoration to come over Danny Nash's body right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You can be seated. So let me tell you what. You don't let anybody tell you it's too late. What perfect timing. I know God gave me this sermon today. So they looked at Jairus and said, oh, your daughter is already dead. It's too late. And Jesus spoke up and said, she's not dead. She's just asleep. And they said, oh, no, you don't understand. She's not breathing. And he said, I can just imagine him saying, no, you don't understand. So listen to me. Don't you let people that don't understand tell you opposite of what God, who does understand, has spoken to you. Amen? So I guess that was number five or four. Uh, intercede for those needing healing. You're welcome. Thank you for keeping me on track. So, for those needing healing. Jeremy, if you'll just keep me posted for my grandmother. Number five, correct? Because I didn't number them. We intercede for those needing deliverance. Let's go to Mark 7, 24 through 30. From there, Jesus arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. 25. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Seraphonician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now listen to me. This was not the demon oppressed daughter going to God for herself. It was a mother going to God for her daughter who was tormented, oppressed by a demon. Listen. You can go to God for people that cannot get to him for themselves. Everyone 
is a child of God, but not everyone knows it or believes it. There are children that belong to Almighty God, and yet they live as orphans. That's why I told you it's going to make sense to you. They can't get to God for themselves because they have been so bound by the lies of the enemy. They have been so bound by addiction brought on by the enemy. They have been so bound by torment from the enemy. They are so controlled by Satan or the kingdom of darkness or they are so deceived by hopelessness that they literally cannot get to God themselves but you can go to God for those that need to be delivered. And you can say, God, here I am for so-and-so. And And they can't get to you because their mind's not thinking right. And let me just tell you how you can pray. You may want to put, you may want to mark the time that it is on Facebook right now and go back and get this or try to write it or something. But you can say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you with the authority of your name, and I bind whatever demon or spirit is controlling or tormenting my brother or my sister, and I command that spirit to take their hands off of his or her will so that she can be free to surrender her life and her will to you, Jesus Christ. Do you see what I'm doing there? There's somebody right here that's so bound by the enemy that they don't even feel like they can get to God. So what do I do? I say, enemy, in the name of Jesus, I am binding you. That means I am taking my hands spiritually, and I am grabbing a hold of you, and I forbid you to continue to control them. Take your hands off of their will so they can be free to get to Jesus Christ. All right? You can do that. And you may not feel it happen the moment you pray it. But you continue because every time you pray it, you are knocking that wall down. But what if nobody intercedes for the people that need deliverance? I have heard for the last time. Well, I haven't heard it for the last time. But I almost feel like I've heard it for the last time without saying something. But it's just not the time to say it. When somebody wants to tell me that the drunk driver whose car is wrapped around the tree, that the sovereign God said it was just time. Absolutely not. That alcohol stole that person's life. And I will tell you, the people in your life that are controlled by the enemy, if somebody doesn't intercede for them, deadly results are coming. We have a responsibility to intercede on behalf of those that need deliverance. Let me tell you what. Skip down to verse 30. And when that lady went home to her house, she found the demon gone out, and her daughter was lying on the bed free from that thing. You may not can even get the person that needs deliverance into this house. Go to the Father. He can get into their house. You got that? You may not can talk the person that needs deliverance into getting to Jesus. Just go to Jesus like the mother. I want you to think about that. The mother had to leave her daughter. Her daughter was tormented. Her daughter needed major hands-on help all the time. She could not control her daughter enough to get her to Jesus. So she said, baby girl, if you can't get to Jesus, by George, I can get to Jesus. And Jesus can get to you. And Jesus traveled so fast that by the time the woman got home, Jesus had already done the work. All right? Your prayer is a ballistic missile. It travels as far as you need it to travel. All right? Number six, right? Number six. 
We have to intercede for those who are deaf and blind. Now, I'm not talking about physically deaf and physically blind. I'm talking about spiritually deaf and spiritually blind. I'm going to use a couple of examples in the Word of God where physically deaf and physically blind people went to Jesus or were taken to Jesus by people that carried them, that interceded for them. But I do want to mention to you today, we don't have a lot of deaf and a lot of blind, although we do have some, don't be limited by just physical deafness and physical blindness because you're surrounded by people that are spiritually deaf and spiritually blind. Their hearts can't hear the truth and receive it because they have been so deafened by lies. Their eyes can't see hope. Their spiritual eyes can't see hope because they have been blinded by circumstances. We have a responsibility to go to God, those of us that do have hope, those of us that can see the power of God in operation. We have a responsibility to carry the spiritually blind and the spiritually deaf to Jesus and say, Father, give them a hearing heart. Open their eyes to see the purpose that you have called them to. Now, I want to tell you, I'll just go ahead, go ahead and admit right now, if you text me about your rebellious child that is in a predicament and you ask me to pray for them, let me just be honest with you. I'm not going to pray for them physically. They may have a physical issue. Or if you text me for their finances, I'm just going to be real with you. I'm not going to pray for their finances. Because if they bust hell wide open rich, my prayer didn't do any good. If they bust hell wide open fully healthy, my prayer didn't do any good. So if you want to bring somebody to me and they're not right with God, I'm promising you, and even if they are, my first prayer is, Father, whatever you can do in this situation, open their eyes to see you for however you need to be revealed to them right now. Because if they don't come out of this, where are they going to spend eternity? So a lot of times, go back and check your prayer list. Are you praying all the time for people's finances and people's toenails and people's eyes that hurt? And maybe you ought to just say, you know what? Let all of God, whatever you can do with all of that work. But I want to pray for some spiritual deafness right now. Because if you heal their body and you don't save their soul, what good has it done for them? All right? I want you to look right here for the, the deaf and blind. Mark 7, 31 through 35. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Verse 32, and, and look right here. Read that first line with me. Then they brought to him one who was deaf, when you intercede for somebody, you take that person to Jesus. When you go to the throne for them, you take that person with you to Jesus. So notice here, they brought a deaf person to Jesus. Go to, and he healed him. Mark eight twenty two. Read here. Then he came to Bethsaida and read this with me. They brought a blind man to him. You take whatever city, whatever nation, whatever child, whatever person you're praying for, when you go to God for them, you are taking them to Jesus because they might not have the faith or the belief to go on their own. Here's a question. No, I'm going to save it. So, number seven. I'm going to save it for this one. 
Mark 2, 1 through 4, we intercede for those who are paralyzed. And again, I'm not talking about paralyzed physically. I'm talking about paralyzed spiritually. I want you to take note right here. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately, next please. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him. They. Look over to your friend and say, they is you. <laughs> they are you. <laughs> they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now listen, you might need to grab you a few prayer partners. And you might need to say, I can't give you all the details but I got somebody that I need you to help me intercede for because they are paralyzed and they can't get to God themselves. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was so that they had broken through and they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Understand here that if those four people were lazy, they would have said, okay, I know where Jesus is, will at least help you get to Jesus. And then they get to Jesus and there's no room and they say, oh, this is just too hard on me. I mean, I, man, I don't have this much time. I, what are you expecting? I don't, I, I got somewhere to be or, or this is too hard of work. Let me just tell you, intercession takes time and it is hard work. But you got to understand that sometimes you have to do the work for somebody else because they are so paralyzed by fear. They are so paralyzed by unbelief. They have been awfully abused and they are so paralyzed by rejection that they can't do it themselves. And a lazy church keeps the paralyzed paralyzed. Sometimes Jesus may wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he may put somebody on your heart. Don't roll over and say, I'm just too tired. It's just too hard. Put forth the effort. You dig through that roof. You carry that person. You're going to sweat. Imagine carrying a 180-pound man, that's about an average weight, not necessarily in the great U.S. of A. where we have hot Cheetos and Mountain Dew, but we'll just kind of be on the nice side, about 180 pounds. Imagine 180 pounds on a stretcher. Four men got to get on a roof. They got to go up, and then they got to lower you may sweat a little bit. You may push the plate back a little bit. But if you don't put forth the energy or you don't want to take the time or it's just too hard, who else is going to do it? And if those four men did not love that man enough, how could he ever have gotten to Jesus? And don't tell me Jesus didn't know about that man because Jesus created that man. But he also left humanity in the hands of his church. And he expects us to do our part to get them to him. Otherwise, everybody's robots. And I've said it before. Nobody will get to heaven and say, God made me come here. Nobody will be there begrudgingly saying, I wish I wasn't here. All right? So that means that our sovereign God wants to intervene, but he puts the intervention in the hands of his church. 
Now, some things that paralyze people. Fear. Fear paralyzes people. Unforgiveness paralyzes people. They can't move forward because they can't let go of the past. So if you have people in your life that are paralyzed by unforgiveness, by fear, addiction paralyzes people. Carry them to the throne. All right, David Clay, if you'll come. Now, so I gave you six things to intercede for. Now I'm going to tell you that seven. I gave you seven. Thank you, Kaylee. I need y'all to keep me straight. I don't know why I didn't remember these things. I gave you seven. Now I'm going to tell you one important ingredient that you have to have. Because without this, you, just say it in these Texan terms, you can't get nobody nowhere. And you ain't going to get nowhere without it, okay? Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, everybody say faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is what? That he is God, that he is the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness. You got to believe that he is. So if I do all the work of carrying you to Jesus, and then I say, okay, God, I sure hope you can. Because he's a tough case, God. I mean, it would be great if you could. So I'm going to bring them to you, but then I'm going to turn away and say, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. I just don't see how it could ever happen. When you get up and walk away in unbelief, you just canceled out your prayer. So when you come to God, don't come to God unless first you're going to know that he is God. And he is bigger than you. And he is better than you. And he is bigger and badder than the worst devil you've ever faced. He is bigger and badder than the worst obstacle or storm you've ever walked through. Get in that posture first before you go to God for anybody, you say, you know what? I'm not even going to come to you if I don't believe in you, but I'm coming to you because I know you are God and you are able. So you got to come. You got to believe that He is. And you got to believe that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So you got to have faith to know you're going to hear my prayer. And I'm going to be diligent. I'm not going to walk away when I didn't see it after one time, Cammie. You keep knocking on God's door for your granddaughters. You keep knocking on God's door for your grandsons. God, here I am again. Why am I here? Because I still believe in you. Here I am because I know you're still able. And you're going to reward me because I'm being diligent to bring my babies to you. And let me show you, all wrapped up, what effective prayer does. James 5, 13 through 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Because you're not an only child. So is there anybody around you that's suffering? That could be tormented. That could be needing deliverance. That could be sick. That could be everything I just mentioned in the seven. Then pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Then sing and rejoice with them. Keep going. Is anybody among you sick? Then call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith. The intercession by the church will interfere.
fear in the results. And they will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's a sinner and he's committed sins, then you're going to intervene between him and the consequences of his sins, and he's going to be forgiven. Keep going. Confess your faults, your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. Because the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous church, a righteous man, makes much available. Everybody stay seated. I'm just going to obey. Can you throw me some oil right there? That playing is beautiful. You know what, Sherry? The Lord just told me, I'm just going to anoint you right now. You stay seated if you want. You don't want to. Yep. She has a kidney that is 80 years old that belongs to her mother, and her mother has already gone on to be with the Lord. And uh, they are doing some biopsies on it right now. Maybe a little concerned that it's beginning to fail you. If you want to intervene in between failed kidney and your sister, then I just want you to stand to your feet. And you know what? The prayer of faith is about to make much available to you. It's about to make restoration available to you, healing available to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, complete restoration right now over her kidney, over her body. As the church of the living God, we come in interceding for our sister. And we say right now, in Jesus' name, healing is being made available. This prayer is effective. So I say over Sherry, Sherry, right now, in the name of Jesus, I command your body to receive the restoration, healing touch of your almighty God, your heavenly Father, right now. And I declare that everything is going to be okay. And you will live and not die, and you will declare the works of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'll show you one last thing. Stay standing. It's time to go. James 5, 17 through 20. Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. He was just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three years and six months. And then he turned around again and prayed that it would rain. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. You have the ability, through the authority that God has given you, as men and women of God operating in faith, to bring rain and to stop rain. You can bring healing, and you can stop sickness. You can bring freedom, and you can stop oppression. Father, I thank you for your word that you have spoken to us. I pray that you would open the hearts of every person that is in this room to recognize the authority and the power that you have given us. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would, equip, that you would grip our hearts with a burden for our brothers and our sisters that are blind and that are deaf and that need deliverance and that are sick and that are oppressed. Grip our hearts with compassion for our cities and our nations. Father, let there be testimonies of you waking us up in the middle of the night to intercede, and then we see the answers. Let there be praise reports of you stopping us in our tracks in the middle of the day, and we take the time to intervene on behalf of our brothers and sisters, and we see you work. Never let us be the same. We get out of our spiritual lazy boys right this minute, 
And we take the mantle that you have passed to us to be the church of the living God. And we will intercede for those around us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.